family. So today what we're going to talk about is where we fit in to the story of God and Israel. Now, like Matt said, a year ago today, we watched as more Jewish people were murdered than any point in time since the Holocaust. It's crazy that we live in a day where that can still happen. And what was their crime? They were Jewish. That was their crime. And so a lot of times we'll talk to churches about modern day Israel, or we'll talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But today, I just wanna talk about where we fit into the story of Israel and God's heart for Israel and the Jewish people. So the title of my message, as you can see, is Israel and Me, My Family Tree. Now I know if you like grammar in this room, then you might be saying, well, technically it's Israel and I, my family tree. But that doesn't rhyme. And if Dr. Seuss taught me anything, it's that rhyming is way more important than grammar. So Israel and Me, My Family Tree. Now, I brought this whiteboard with me, and uh, I don't know about you, I'm a visual learner, so I love seeing it, not just hearing it. So today, before we talk about Israel and where we fit into that tree, we're going to take a step back and kind of do a little bit of a Bible recap. But before we even recap the scriptures from Genesis to where we are today, we need to realize that from the Bible's perspective— there are two major distinctions. No matter where you're from, no matter what color your skin is, you will fit into two distinctions. The first one is male and female. And the church said, amen, amen right? <clears throat> Wouldn't have gotten an amen like 20 years ago, but nowadays they're like, amen. Okay, male and female. No matter who you are, you fit into two distinctions. And I know we love diversity and God created diversity and God is the author of diversity. However, from a biblical perspective, you fit into two. You're male or female. The other major distinction in the Bible that every single person fits into, no matter where you're from or what color your skin is, is Jew and Gentile. You will see this all throughout Scripture. From Genesis 1 to Revelation, you will see male and female. And from Genesis 12 to Revelation, you will continue to see Jew and Gentile. We all fit into one of these two distinctions. Now, if you have your Bibles, you can flip to Genesis 12. In Genesis 12, God creates this distinction with Abraham. He says, my heart's desire is to make you into a great nation, to bless you, to make your name great so that you may be a blessing. My desire is to bless those who bless you, but whoever curses you, I will curse. And in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. So God tells Abraham, I'm going to make you into an, a nation. And that nation is going to be Israel. And all throughout scripture, you will see Jew and Gentile, and you will see Israel and the nations. And right here in Genesis 12, God tells Abraham, I'm going to make you a nation, and I'm going to be the God of your family, and in you, all families will be blessed. So God's purpose was always to use Israel to bring all the nations into his family, but the way he did that was by saying, this is my family. And that's why he's constantly saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Notice he doesn't say, I'm the God of Egypt. I'm the God of Babylon. I mean, technically, we would say, well, technically he is, right? Because he's the God of the universe. But God says, no, I'm the God of Israel. I'm the God of this family. Now, here's the thing that we don't often think about when we read the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, what the Jewish people call the Tanakh, is if you wanted to be in the family of God, you had to be born into the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's hard to deal with, especially now, because many of us are Gentiles. We don't like the exclusivity of that. But if you wanted to be in the family of God, 
then you had to convert into the family of Israel, which means you would have to be circumcised if you were a male. You'd have to obey the entire commandments of God, the Torah. You have to yoke yourself, is the biblical language, to Israel. And this was very rare. You see this in instances like Rahab or Ruth, where they are saying, I will become part of your nation, and I will obey the Torah. Very seldom seldom did it happen in Scripture. Something that happened more often was when someone became a God-fearer, and that is someone of the nations who understands that the God of Israel is the one true God, but they're not going to become part of Israel. For example, Naaman. Remember when Naaman dips himself in the Jordan River seven times? Well, that story has a really weird ending because Naaman tells Elijah, um, hey, I might have to go back to my country and work in the temple, and I might have to bow my knee to a foreign god. What should I do? What would our answer be? Absolutely not. What was Elijah's? Yeah, that's fine. What? Why would he say that? Because he wasn't part of the family. He remained part of the nations. He knew that God was the God of Israel, but he wasn't in the family of God. He was a God-fearer. And this is how the story of God works all throughout the scriptures until one man. You know who that man was? It wasn't Jesus. I know that's usually the correct answer in church. (laughs) Cornelius. Because up until Cornelius, this was the understanding of all the Jewish people. And I know we know that Jesus was Jewish, especially because you watch The Chosen nowadays, and you're like, come on, I mean... So Jewish. But people still struggle with the fact that Jesus is Jewish. Right now, sitting on the throne. And when he comes back in Revelation, what does he come back as? A Jewish male. Because he's still operating in the distinctions God made. He comes back in Revelation as the lion of the tribe of Judah. You know why? Because he's a Jew. Duh. (laughs) He never stopped. But some people think, well, Jesus really came to start a new religion. What religion is that? He was the Messiah of Israel. And there's so many scriptures that we actually don't really want to pay attention to, like when the angel Joseph says, name the boy Jesus, in Hebrew, Yeshua, which means Savior. And the angel says, because he will be a Savior. To his people. We're like, did he mean the world? Because we live in the John 3.16 world. God so loved the world. But then we read scriptures like the Syrophoenician woman who says, Jesus, please heal my daughter. And Jesus says, I came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we're like, someone tell Jesus his purpose, please. But his purpose was to fulfill Genesis 12. He had to complete the story of Israel before the nations could come into the family. So his mission was to Israel. And when Israel was saved, the nations could come in. This didn't happen until Cornelius in Acts 10. In Acts 10, this Gentile gets this vision from God, go send for Peter. They send for Peter. He comes to Peter's, or Peter comes to his house, which was against Jewish custom, because you don't go into a Gentile's house, because then you're unclean, can't go in the temple. But God sends this vision to Peter. Remember the sheet getting taken down from heaven, all these unclean animals. And what is Peter's response? God, I've no unclean food has ever touched my lips. Why would he say that? Because he's Jewish. <laughs> We have this idea, but like, well, the disciples, they were the first Christians. What does that mean? They followed Jesus. Yeah. Christian means follower of Jesus. There are male and female followers of Jesus, and now there are Jew and Gentile followers of Jesus. The distinctions remain. So then Peter goes into this Gentile's house, and he is starting to share the gospel. And read Acts Acts 10 later, And you'll see that when he's sharing the gospel, something amazing happens. Here's what I think Peter was probably gearing towards. He was going to get to his altar call and say, okay, Cornelius, you can either do what generations have done before you, remain a God-fearer, 
You're not, you're not in the family of God, but that's okay. Or you can convert into the family of God. And you have to be circumcised, obey the Torah. And you know what happens? Scripture is very clear. Before Peter was even done speaking. Why? I don't think God wanted him to make this altar call. Before Peter was even done speaking, the Holy Spirit fell, which was God's way of saying, I am affirming him as a Gentile. And remember, the Holy Spirit fell, and they started speaking in tongues. And remember, that wasn't a charismatic thing. That was a Jewish thing. And Peter then proclaims, maybe something new is happening. Maybe all those scriptures like Genesis 12 that God was going to bring in the whole, all the families of the earth into the family, maybe that's happening right now. And so they have this big council meeting in Acts 15, the council of Jerusalem. And I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to just stay here for one second because in Acts 15, there's a council of Jerusalem, okay? I'm going to write that, council of Jerusalem. It's an incredible part of scripture where all of the Jewish followers of Jesus the Jewish followers of Jesus get together in a room because Peter's seen the Gentiles want to follow Jesus. Paul has seen the Gentiles want to follow Jesus. But then there's also Pharisees who now follow Jesus. And they're battling with what do we do with all these Gentiles? Because they've always had to come into the family by being circumcised and then obeying the Torah and the kosher food laws and being Jewish. But maybe God's doing, God is doing something different. So they meet at the Council of Jerusalem to ask one question. Do the Gentiles need to become Jewish, to be circumcised, to obey Torah, to have kosher food laws, or can they remain Gentile? And you know what their answer was? No, they don't have to become Jewish. So their answer was, no, they can stay Gentile. And it says in Acts 15, there was great celebration in all of the churches. I'd celebrate too if I was a man and realized I didn't have to be circumcised. (laughs) Hallelujah. Praise God. But you know, there's another meeting that many people don't know about. And it was in A.D. 325. That was a terrible five. AD 325, and this was called the Council of Nicaea. And all of the Gentile followers of Jesus got together, because at this point, the Roman church, the the Roman uh, empire had become predominantly Christian, and the leader Constantine, who was the one who kind of led that charge of Rome becoming Christian, got together all of the Gentile followers of Jesus, and they asked the same type of question. Do Jewish people need to become Christian in order to follow Jesus and cut off their Jewish identity? And you know what their answer was? Yes. Jews cannot stay Jews. And we have been operating with this theology for almost 1,700 years. We've been telling Jewish people, if you need to follow Jesus, if you desire to follow Jesus, then you have to abandon your Jewish identity. Where is this in Scripture? Jesus is Jewish. All of his disciples are Jewish. And then we get to someone like Paul, and we're like, oh, but Paul, he converted on the road to Damascus. Converted to what? He was a Jewish follower of the Torah, and then he got a revelation to who the Jewish Messiah of Israel was. That's pretty Jewish. And then he tells us constantly in Scripture, Acts 21, 39, Paul says, I am a Jewish, ding, 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 man. Ding, 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 there's the two distinctions. I'm a Jewish man, still. He could have added that, still. He didn't think he needed to, but he should have, still. Philippians 3, 5, Paul says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in the regards of Torah, a Pharisee. He's like, guys, I'm so Jewish. 
And we're like, but did you convert though to Christianity? What are we talking about? He's constantly telling us, I'm very, very Jewish. And we're like, okay. <laughs> Once you convert it. So we need to understand that Jew and Gentile is a God-given distinction. Now let me talk about the one verse that people use to throw this out. It's all in our YouTube comments. It's usually preceded by like, hey, idiots, and then they give us the scripture. Galatians 3.28. This is the scripture. Wait, put it down for a second, because they don't like to quote the whole scripture. There is no longer Jew and Gentile. Idiots, I added that part, but it's kind of, it's in the vibe of the comments. And then people get upset. Why are you trying to bring back what God destroyed? God broke down this distinction. Like, you guys are heretics. Why are you talking about this? Now let's throw that scripture back up. There is no longer Jew and Gentile, slave or free. Oh, shoot. Male and female. There is no longer male and female. Does that mean that when you accept Jesus, you are no longer male and female? Of course not. In fact, we're arguing pretty strong in the church. Absolutely not. Galatians 3.20. Oh, wait, what? Galatians 3.28? They should shout that at us. Unless Paul is not talking about breaking down a distinction. He's talking about breaking down a barrier. In a patriarchal society where male was better than female, where free was better than slave, and where Jew was better than Gentile, because they had the covenant and the Gentiles didn't. Paul is saying now, because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, now we can all boldly enter into the throne room of grace, and there is no longer Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, free. We all have access because of Jesus. He's not breaking down the distinction of male, female, Jew, or Gentile. He's breaking down the wall of separation is what Ephesians says. When you understand this, then you will get clarity in three areas. So I'm going to kind of go through them pretty quick. The first one is our position. When you understand the Jew-Gentile distinction, you understand our position in the family. How are we in the family of God? Because you talk to most Christians, which are predominantly Gentiles. Are you in the family of God? Absolutely. How did that happen? Through Jesus. So what position do you have in the family? Uh, Now we're starting to lose people. Our position in the family is that we are adopted. That's That's what Scripture tells us very clearly. Romans 8, 15 You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall again into fear. Rather, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. He's talking to the Gentiles right here. He says, you guys received the spirit of adoption, which makes sense because this analogy, he's saying, essentially, Israel was like the biological kids. They've been here for thousands of years, but because of what Jesus did, now you guys get to be adopted into the family. In Romans 11, he uses a different analogy. In Romans 11... He gives this picture of a tree. And he says that the roots of this tree, the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And through the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these natural branches started bursting forth. Who would the natural branches of the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob covenant be? The Jews, right? They're the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then Paul says, I wish I had a different color. We do need that pink marker, Matt. He says, now you Gentiles, you guys were just wild olive shoots on the ground. You were part of the family. I know it makes us feel a little weird, but we weren't. If you're a Gentile, you were not part of the family of God. But by Jesus and his miraculous salvation on the cross that he gave us, Paul says he grafted us in to a tree that was not our own. So 
Romans 8 and Romans 11, two analogies saying the same thing. You were adopted into the family. You were grafted into the family tree. And then Romans 11 says something very serious. He says, but don't boast against the branches. For you do not support them. They supported you. We are standing on the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now we can say, Father Abraham and many sons, many sons have fathers. I am one of them. How are you a son or daughter of Abraham? By adoption. When you understand that you're adopted into the family, and here's the cool thing about being adopted. Being a biological son or daughter and being an adopted son or daughter, they both have really cool claims. The biological sons and daughters, They came forth from their mother's womb. That's amazing. That's a miracle. The adopted sons and daughters, my parents loved me so much that they flew across the world and they bought me. That's amazing. They chose me. But what happens in Scripture when God chooses one son first? What do the other sons love to do? Attack the chosen one. What did Joseph's brothers do? They knew that he was the favored one prodigal son story. What did the other brother want to do to the brother that left? There's this constant narrative in scripture, Isaac and and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, all these times where God says, I'm choosing you. And rather than the other one saying, well, then I'm going to bless what God's blessing. They say, I'm going to take out what my father chose. Do you know that no, uh, no, or no more Jews, uh, let me say this a different way, No people group has killed more Jews than Christians. Think about that for a second. The adopted children have been the number one persecutors of the chosen ones. We're replaying the story of Scripture and we don't even know it. Because we have this orphan spirit that says, I don't like that God chose something. Especially in our modern day Christianity, we we want everything to be about us. What is God saying to me? What is scripture saying to me? Where where do I fit in this story? I'll be King David in this story. And again, that's not wrong in and of itself, but if that is the only reason we're reading scripture, then we are missing it. Because scripture doesn't tell us only about ourselves. It's supposed to tell us about our God. And if our God chooses something, we only have two options. Either get behind what he chose or oppose what he chose. And sadly, most of the world right now is opposing what God chose. So when you understand our position, the next thing you understand is our partnership. I want to read you a scripture that I always misinterpreted. I probably preached it. And it's Romans 8, that same scripture we talked about, Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall again into fear. Rather, we received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Ruach, or the Spirit himself, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Hallelujah. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Messiah. You've probably heard it, joint heirs with Christ. Have you heard that scripture before? I'm a joint heir with Christ. Here's what I always thought that meant. Me and Jesus are joint heirs. Like, me and Jesus get to do this thing together now. Because of what his sacrifice meant, I now have the righteousness of God, and so me and Jesus are like co-partners now. Praise God. If that's what Paul was trying to say, he wouldn't need the word joint. I would just be an heir with Christ. Joint is where two or more are coming together. So who am I, a Gentile, This is who's Paul talking about. I've been adopted in the family. Who am I a joint heir with? Well, you might be like, he's going to say Israel. Maybe I'm feeding that into the scripture. But let's look at Ephesians 3, 2, where Paul is speaking again on this same topic. In Ephesians 2, we'll start in verse 6. He's talking about this mystery of God. And he says, the mystery is, this is like Paul's greatest revelation in scripture. Have you ever read the Bible and you've found something that no one's ever found before? And you're like, oh my, this is amazing. I'm the first one. Paul's having that experience. I'll read the whole verse because I want you to feel Paul's giddiness at sharing this. Surely you have heard of the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. Wow. 
He's like, this is a mystery, and, I, and God just showed me this. As I have already written briefly, in reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. In Hebrew, the mystery of Messiah, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. It's, it's big to say, like, I read my Bible that other Christians haven't read. It's one thing to say, I have revelation the prophets didn't have. That's pretty big. What's this mystery? Verse 6, here it is. Paul's ready to share. The mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. Show it on the screen so they know I'm not making this up. That's the David translation. No, this is the biblical translation. We are heirs together with Israel. Next slide. It's verse 6. Oh, we don't have it? Well, then I'm not making it up, I promise. You can read it in your own, own Bible. So, we are heirs together with Israel. Now, I want to read a scripture to you that we often, we don't take it out of context in like the historical word. We don't think about the analogy that Paul's trying to use. When male and female come into a covenant together, right? The Bible says they become something. What do they become? One, right? They become one or one flesh is what many translations say. Are they still male, female? But they're one. But we know one doesn't mean one new gender. We, we understand it means they maintain their God-given distinctions, but there's a new unity that was not there before. And now they are supposed to serve one another, love one another, honor one another. Any married people in the room? Maybe have a little friction with one another. But in that is the unity. Ephesians 2.14, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. He took Jew and Gentile and united them into one people. Some say, some translations say one new man. And we look at that and we go, oh, Christian. Back up. We should all be thinking, oh, like marriage, a new covenant. What does the New Testament mean? New covenant. In a new covenant. I've done weddings before. When I do a wedding, I tell the male and the female, you guys are making a covenant under God. There's actually three people in this wedding right now. You, your spouse, and God. And you are becoming one. That's what God was trying to initiate in the New Testament. Jews, Gentiles, you guys are in a new covenant now under Christ. You are joint heirs with Christ and are supposed to be unified. You're supposed to serve one another, love one another, bless one another, maybe have a little bit of friction because Jews and Gentiles are different. But imagine that you're married to your spouse, but never think about them, never talk to them, maybe never even met them. How thriving would your marriage be? That's the state of the Christian church in many ways. And lastly, we understand our position as adopted sons and daughters. We understand our partnership as joint heirs with Israel. And lastly, we understand our purpose. What's so interesting about our purpose is if you ask 90% of Christians, tell me about your purpose as a Gentile, they'd be like, my what? I don't have one. <laughs> I don't think there is one. But if you go to Israel right now and you ask any religious Jewish, Jewish person, you know you will get pretty much the same answer. If you said, what's your purpose as Jews? They would all tell you the same thing. Be a light to the nations. Light to the nations. It's all throughout their scripture. Light to the nation, light to the nation. They're all quoting Genesis 12. God chose us to be a light to the nations. I have Orthodox friends that are trying to build these buildings so that Christians and Muslims can come and learn about the God of Israel because they're like, this is what we're supposed to do. We're light to the nations. 
Now, Gentiles, because I'm sure th- this room is predominantly Gentiles, um, what are, what's our purpose? They have Genesis 12. Well, we've forgotten ours. It's Romans 11, verse 11. Romans 11, 11 talks about the tree, and he says this. I say then, did the Jewish people stumble so as to fall? Some translations say, did they stumble so far that now they can't get up again? Like, are they gone forever because they rejected Jesus? Listen to what Paul says. May it never be. He literally goes against the theology that most churches are preaching. Well, the Jews rejected Jesus, so God rejected them, and now he allowed the church to come in, and now we are the spiritual Israel. Paul literally says, may that never be said, especially from the platform, please. May it never be. But their false step, salvation, by their false step, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Two. This word could also be translated as for. Or because, this is our purpose, to provoke Israel to jealousy. We never talk about the scripture because we have no idea what it means. It is the purpose of every Gentile. We struggle with it for two reasons. One, because we think jealousy is a bad thing. But all throughout the Hebrew scriptures, God will say, my name is jealous. Well, his name can't be something evil or sinful because we confuse jealousy with coveting. If I want something that belongs to you, I'm coveting. If you are trying to take what belongs to me, I'm jealous. If I want your wife, I am coveting what belongs to you. If you try to flirt with my wife, which many have tried, I will become jealous. Why? Because she's my wife. Paul uses this word because we are supposed to be grafted into this tree by the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, worshiping the God of Israel. And they look at the relationship that we have with the God of Israel, and they say, What? That's ours. And we're like, Father Abraham had many. And they're like, you don't even, you don't even, what? I am from Abraham's seed. And we're like, adopted. (laughs) But we don't. What we say is, Christ Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Okay, well, Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. We don't use that. We use Christ. Again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but we worship Christ. Christ is God, and we worship the three-in-one God, and Christ is our focus. That has led Israel to believe that's a different God. Because we don't talk about the fact that we worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We don't talk about the fact that we worship the God of Israel. How many songs do we talk about worshiping the God of Israel? There are some out there, but they're very seldom. We mostly talk about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And for thousands of years, we've painted him as this white guy with blue eyes and blonde hair. And we talk about that, that he is Christ, which is a word that's not native to them. And for 1,700 years, the church has been telling the Jewish people, and if you need to convert or desire to convert to Christianity, you have to abandon your Judaism, which would be the same thing as me saying, you want to follow Jesus? Yes, he changed my life. Okay, you have to switch genders. You'd be like, I don't think so. Yes, yes, 100%, because your gender murdered our Lord. So you have to change genders. That's the decision that we've given the Jewish people for 1,700 years. And even worse than the fact, or maybe just as bad as the fact that we did it, is the fact that we forgot we did it. We don't even know our history. We read about the Inquisition or the Crusades or the Holocaust. Those are self-proclaimed Christians. We struggle with it because we learn about it as if it's just like, no, the Hitler and the Nazis, they just like sprung up from hell. You're like, really? 
Or was Germany actually the most Christian nation in Europe? 97% Christian. The Nazis wore belts that said, God is with us. They had crosses and New Testaments. You go to Israel today and you have a cross in the New Testament, that does not speak peace and love and forgiveness to them. It speaks murder. So we have to understand and get back to the roots of our faith, which is in the covenants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, worshiping the God of Israel through Yeshua. The reason that we were adopted is through Jesus, but we worship the God of Israel. Does that make sense? And if we do that, we will provoke Israel to jealousy. And I've seen it happening in the land of Israel where Christians will come, come to Israel, they'll move to Israel, they're fully Gentile, and they will talk about God speaking to them. Well, most Jewish people, they don't hear from God. But what do they read in their scriptures? Moses heard, Abraham heard, Isaac heard, Jacob heard. Who'd you say you heard from? Christ Jesus. Okay, yeah, never mind. Okay, I have to... No, I, I heard from the God of Israel. What? And I'm not trying to be Jewish. I'm adopted into the family. I'm still Gentile. And you should stay Jewish. If you tell a Jewish person that, especially in Israel, they will, it will blow their minds because that's not the message they've gotten from the church. They've gotten you need to convert into a new identity and forget your Jewish culture. But I don't think that's God's heart. I'm going to ask the band to come back up. As we close, I want to end with really just one thing practical. And then I want to pray for Israel. Because they need to have a revelation into Yeshua and a revelation about their God. It's not a different God. We sometimes think he's different because we read the Old and, T- Old and New Testament as two different books, but they are the same God. And you know, the most exciting thing about this is Jesus told us exactly what would happen that would precede his coming back. You talk to the church and everyone's like, we need to worship, we need to pray, we need to become pure. Jesus is coming back for a spotless bride. We want revival. We want to usher in the time of the second coming. You know, Jesus told us exactly what has to happen for that to come. We don't often talk about it, but in Matthew 23, Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem. And many times people talk about this and they only focus on the fact that he's telling Jerusalem, you're about to be persecuted because you rejected me, which is true. He says, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets. I wanted to bring you under under my wings like a mother hen, but you rejected me, and now you're going to face the consequences of that. But I think sometimes we forget he's weeping. He's not angry. He's heartbroken. Paul later basically says the same thing. He says, I would trade my salvation if it meant the salvation of my people. And then Jesus makes this incredible statement. He's speaking to Jerusalem, and he says, you will not see me again until you cry out Baruch haba b'shem Adonai which is from the Psalms Psalm of David which means blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord Jesus says I will not come back you will not see me again until who cries out for him? the Jewish people you ask most Gentiles when is Jesus coming back? when the whole world hears the gospel That's amazing, and that's part of the great commandment, the great commission. But when the gospel goes to the whole world, where do you think it's coming back to? It's an echo. Right now, Israel is 0.01 or 0.02% believing in Jesus, the place where it came from. I think it's because the enemy knows the minute they start crying out for Yeshua, I'm done. So I'm going to put that off for as long as possible, and he's going to use the adopted kids to help his mission. We have to pray for Israel. We have to pray for the Jewish people. We have to worship God in such a way it provokes them to jealousy, not drives them away, because we have a different gospel. So I want you to stand with me. And sometimes when we talk about this, there can be a little bit of a stirring in your heart. 
I don't like this. This doesn't make sense to me. Because we're used to being the main characters of the story, the church. But here's the beautiful thing about our purpose. Husbands, what's your purpose? Love your wife the way Christ loved the church and died for her, right? That's what Ephesians says. And then it says, wives, love your husbands and honor your husbands and submit to your husbands the way that the church submits to Christ. Did you notice that their purpose was not about themselves? He didn't say, husbands, be the best husbands you can be. Wives, spend time with me every day and be the best wife possible. He says, husbands, your purpose is 100% about your wife. Wife, your purpose is 100% about your husband. Because if both are serving each other, then both of them are having their needs met, but they're not being selfish. Genesis 12, Israel, bless the nations. Romans 11, Gentiles, bless Israel. We're supposed to serve one another. So that's what I wanna do right now. I want you to close your eyes with me. And I just want you to ask the Holy Spirit before we begin praying for Israel, ask the Holy Spirit, is there anything in my heart right now that doesn't reflect your heart for Israel and the Jewish people? Is there anything that I've felt in my heart that you don't have in yours? Because I want the same heart. And just say, God, give me your heart for Israel and the Jewish people. And we just lift your hands out. We're going to pray and bless the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. God, we thank you. We know that the only city in the world we're commanded to pray for is Jerusalem. And we pray peace over Jerusalem. We pray peace over the holy city. Lord, we pray blessing over Israel and over the Jewish people. And may you reveal yourself to them where they would cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes. Yeshua, I pray that you would reveal yourself to your people. In Yeshua's name we pray. And everyone said, amen.